We're going to start jumping into some of the algorithms, uh, some of the, the, the theory and algorithms kind of behind what's in best fit um, and behind the Bayesian, uh, the Bayesian Bayes theorem, our, our Bayesian estimation analysis tool. So, so here we're going to talk specifically about likelihood. Um, this is kind of a key component. So there's three main components of the Bayes theorem, and so this is one of them. <clears throat> All right, so in this lecture, we're going to kind of look more into what the likelihood function is. We're going to review a few of the basics and probability, uh, hopefully having that basic understanding. Uh, it'll make sense how the likelihood function that we end up using actually comes about how it's derived. Um, and so that'll help us describe likelihood function a little better for you. And then we're going to look at um, how the likelihood function, that equation, changes per data source. So remember, we've got systematic data. We've got interval data, like historical floods or PSIs. And then we've got um, perception thresholds, right? So how does that likelihood equation change per data source? So we'll look at that briefly and talk a little bit more about that. And then we'll look at some examples of just what's going on with the likelihood function. All right, so this is our basic likelihood function. So it, it likelihood function describes the joint probability of the observed data X as a function of the parameter theta um, of a chosen statistical model. So what it's saying is the probability, so what is the probability that the data came from the model? So if, when we say, when I'm gonna say this throughout these presentations, theta is a statistical model. That statistical model is a parameter distribution. So what do we use in flood hydrology for flow frequency, peak flow frequency? What are we using as our distribution most of the time? LB3. So in these equations, when you see theta, or you hear statistical model or model or distribution, in flow frequency, be thinking, how does the, the probability of the data that fits our LP3 distribution? So you remember we, with that last example, there was a thousand different LP3s that we were looking at. So we're going to be looking at, you're, it's going to be looking at multiple LP3s and seeing how the data fits each one of those. So that's what we're talking about is likelihood. <clears throat> All right, so back to some of the basics. Um, maybe you remember these. <laughs> uh, um, maybe you have to relearn them. I, I had to kind of rethink about a lot of this stuff. So these are some of the basic probabilities that go into our likelihood function. So we've got marginal probability. Uh, so the marginal probability of an event A is really simply probability of A, same thing with B, is probability of B, right? So pretty straightforward. We've got conditional probabilities. So this is the probability of A given B. So that's your conditional probability. So now we got joint probability. So that's the probability of A and B, okay? And you could probably remember this, like the upside down U there is... If it helps, it looks kind of like an A. Maybe you remember it's an and. If it, the U is right side up, it's an or. So here we're looking at probability A given uh, A and B. So, but basically the joint probability is the conditional probability. So probability A given B times the marginal probability. So that's what a joint probability is. So it's a conditional probability times a, a marginal probability. So um, if we have, if A and B is ID, remember we mentioned earlier, it's important, it's always important to like try to make sure we have independent and identically, uh, identically distributed data. So if we have that, then A and B are, so if A and B are independent, then the conditional probability equals the marginal probability. So it's very important. Um, simple mathematical trick right there. So if it's independent ID, the conditional probability is equal to the marginal probability. So if you have that, then the joint probability um, equation becomes the marginal probability of A times the mar marginal probability of B. So it's just the product of the two marginal. So uh, with this substitution, of course, the joint probability just becomes that product that produces the, you know, of the probability of A and B. And so this is, again, this is kind of a key to the theorem. So as long as they're independent, 
we basically remove that conditional probability, making it just a marginal probability. So that's going to be important to remember. Now we have the joint probability is equal to the marginal probability of A times the marginal probability of B. So I'm sorry, it's a lot of probabilities to say. <laughs> okay, so now let's say we have an array of independent, so ID data, like X. So we have however many years of data, X1, X2, out to Xn, 80, 70, whatever years you got, right? Um, so what is the joint probability, which is our likelihood, so that is that all these events came from the same theta, the same model, the same distribution. So remember our, our key mathematical concept is that we just made in the slide before. So if we have the IID data, the joint probability is simply the product of the probabilities, which in this case, the, that means we just have the probability of the data like X1 and X2 out to Xn given the model. So it's just the product of those. Um, so that brings us kind of back to our original likelihood equation. That's how we get here. That's how we get the original likelihood equation. It's, it's the product of the function of x given theta. So if you think about it, like if you have 80 years of record, what is the likelihood of each one of those data points given a certain theta? So, and that total is your total likelihood. So that's what we're doing. We're doing the product of that. So, we get here again because it's ID data and we can make the conditional probability equal to the marginal probability. So now it's just the product of those probabilities. <clears throat> so, so all the formulas we've used, we, so, so far we've been looking at the formulas in real space. So, but we really don't wanna work in real space. We wanna work in logs. We kind of seen that a little bit in the, the mean hazard. We wanna work in log space. So um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons is this arithmetic Underflow, it's a funny math thing that happens with computers. Um, essentially, the, the likelihood values are really small numbers and we've got the product of those if it's in real space. So if you start multiplying very small numbers, what happens to the numbers? They get smaller really fast. And so in computer terms, if you're dealing in real space with really small numbers, you could technically kind of move that value towards zero, but not actually be zero. And in programming language, you get this thing called underflow. So if you go to log space, the numbers get a lot bigger and this problem goes away. Um, the other reason we deal with this is, uh, we deal with these equations of log is it makes the math easier or simpler. Um, again, we, we reduce the joint probability or the likelihood equation down to just the product of the data. But converting the formula to log space converts the formula from product to addition. Um, basically, there's this rule that, you know, if, uh, using the rule in the equation, you know, if we put a natural log in front of it, um, it basically converts it from the product of each data source to the ln of x plus. So now we're not multiplying each data given the, given the model, we're actually adding them up. So it, you know, dealing with addition versus multiplication just makes all the math easier. So we're basically dealing with log space for two reasons. One, it makes the numbers more real and to be able to work with, and two, it switches us to addition of the numbers versus uh, the product. And you'll see that more in the spreadsheets when we get there. So back to this likelihood equation. So. We have the rules we, you know, we kind of discussed earlier with the joint probability um, is the product of the function of X given theta uh, when we have IID data. So that makes the conditional probability equal to the marginal probability. So now when we switch that, that long formula again to log space by adding the natural log on both sides, it changes the right side of the equation from multiplication to addition. And now when we look at that original likely equation that we've already seen a couple times, and switch to log space, now we have the sum of the function of x given theta. And yeah, so hopefully that you follow some of that. So it, we basically just try to trick it and make it easier. Um, so what we've been looking at so far, those, that, that basic likelihood equation that we've been looking at, so especially now that we have the sum of the data given theta. So what we've been looking at, that's the equation for systematic data.
So it's kind of our straightforward equation that looks at the likelihood of each systematic data value given the parameter, the LP3. So then again, taking the natural log of that, <coughs> uh, we get this equation um, where we're just adding the likelihood of each data given the theta, given the model um, for a total likelihood. So we do this, as you saw, like uh, if you remember in the, uh, the, there's all that blue highlighted sets of LP3 and the mean hazard. So we do this for each set. We do that a whole bunch of times and then we add that up to get the, the uh, and we figure out which one is the highest likelihood of that set. And that's what that solved to, like what that number one is solved to. So in log space, the highest likelihood is technically the least negative. So when you're looking at them, you want the value that's closest to zero, the smallest negative value. <laughs> that makes sense. So this is kind of like a, it's, it's, this is similar to what we do with maximum likelihood uh, estimation. So MLE, we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. So now again, this is just the systematic data. Um, so of course we have a couple other types of data. So let's go ahead and look at those and see how that, how things change up a little bit. So we've covered this a little bit in some of the data sources. So we'll cover it here again. We've got a couple other different um, sensor data types. So there's of course interval sensor data. Again, this is our historical floods our paleo stage indicators or PSIs. So interval data is represented by the range of a flow for a given year. Um, and then we like to put in best fit, we put a most likely value. So if you're using another program, you might not have that, but we have that most likely value in there, that little blue dot. So then there's left sensor data. Uh, left sensor data means we believe the flow is less than some threshold. So this is usually designated by that shaded areas that you've seen. Um, again, this in flow frequency, we call this our perception threshold. This is our, you know, uh, represented by the period of years for perception threshold or like a uh, paleo non exceedance bound in NAB. So then we've got one other type. Um, I think I was looking in 17C, it's binomial censored. It's just easier to say it's right censored data. It, it basically, it's not very common for us to have. So we don't really deal with it much, and we're not going to really talk about it much in this course. It's something you're not going to come across much. It, there is a trick way of doing it here in BestFit, but for the most part, it just basically means we have a threshold um, that the flow was at least, so like some low threshold and greater. So it's a it's a right threshold, so where it's instead of the left sensor where we have a high value that we put in and it's down to zero, this one's some low value up to infinity. So it's something we don't really cover much. You don't really run into it. Um, you get it with, if you had like a, a stage gauge that only read at a certain flow or higher. And so you know it read at that point, but you don't know how high, but it couldn't have been lower than that for it to be able to read, something like that. But All right, so we're gonna look at these with cumulative distribution functions, the CDFs. Um, when we're talking about these sensor data, that's a little easier to understand than looking at it with a PDF. But if you remember, the PDF is just the derivative of the CDF, you know, it's just the area of the curve. So interval sensor data for the range is from the upper to the lower. So again, historical flows or PSI is something you have a range of flow. So we have some idea of what that is, right? So rather than having the likelihood of a single value, given the parameter distribution, we need to look at the difference between the upper and the lower value given that theta, that distribution. So for an interval sensor data, we have the joint probability of the data that it is more than and less than some flow value given theta. So all that means is we're just gonna subtract the upper likelihood from the lower likelihood. So again, when we convert that to log space, now we can add that formula, that likelihood of the upper minus lower to our other data. So the equation kind of looks like this now. So we have the, the black part, which is what we talked about. It's the systematic likelihood. So that's what you'll use when you're going through to calculate the likelihood of the systematic. And the blue part now is that you would have one of those for each interval, historical interval you have. You'd have the upper minus the lower, and you can add that to your likelihood of the systematic or add that additional historical intervals. So you'd have several, you'd have blue portions for every historical interval you have. So 
that's our likelihood for um, interval sensor data. So left censored, you might get an idea maybe why we call it left censored. So it's the it's an upper threshold, but no lower. So every, it's left censored is from the, the upper. So um, this is like, again, our perception thresholds or NABs from paleo data. So the equation for the left censored considers the upper threshold flow value given the given like our theta set to the power of the threshold period minus the number of events that exceed the threshold period during the during that period. So let's cover that. So H is our threshold period. So how many years is that perception? Did you put in one year or I guess did you put in two years up to whatever, hundred years, hundreds of years of data for like an A, B or something. So H is our threshold period. K is the number of events that exceed the threshold during the perception threshold period. Now, for the most part, we're assuming there isn't any events that exceed that period in that that's shaded, right? So you, you wouldn't, for the most part, you're not going to have a point in that threshold that exceeds it. So for the most part, we're assuming k is zero. So making that assumption, you know, and switching again to the log space, this thing gets a little simpler again. Um, so now all we've got is the likelihood of the left sensor for the likelihood of the left sensor data. What we're looking at is um, the length of the threshold period times the basically the upper threshold given theta. So the ln of that, of course. And if you notice, like the, this portion of it looks very similar to the, inter, the interval sensor we just looked at. The difference is that the lower bound is basically set to zero, so it drops out. So you've just got h, your number of years, times the ln of the your your data given the theta. So for that upper values. So again, now we for every perception threshold you can add because we've got all this again add in that green section here of the code for each perception threshold you can add that in and so with all of that you'll add that get a total likelihood of all that data given a theta given an lp3 parameter and that will give you some log likelihood value you'll do that and best fit we do that 10,000 times and if you search through the 10,000 times whichever one had the closest log likelihood to zero is your most likely distribution, your most likely LB3, given this data. That most likely LB3 is what in uh, best fit? What, what term? Do you remember? Posterior mode. Yeah, that's your mode. So that most likely. So that's what we're, when we're talking about this log likelihood and we're trying to find that smallest value, negative value close to zero, we're trying to find that mode. Okay, so examples of using likelihood are things like maximum likelihood estimation or base theorem. Remember, likelihood, so MLE isn't Bayes, but likelihood is used in both MLE and Bayes theorem. So we'll talk more about Bayes in the next lecture. So, but using, but best fit technically actually, so best fit actually uses MLE and Bayes theorem, a likelihood in Bayes theorem in the program itself. You'll see, um, the second portion, so there's input, there's distribution fitting, and then there's the Bayesian estimation analysis in best fit currently. That middle one, that distribution fitting, actually uses MLE. And the reason, because, the reason it does that is because all you're using at that point is your input data. Your input data is just systematic data, historical intervals, and perception thresholds, no priors. So MLE um, is a good estimator. It's, it's appropriate to estimate for that input data. Once you get into Bayesian estimation or Bayes theorem, we're incorporating prior information and MLE can't do that. There's a different, um, uh, there's a different likelihood, uh, <laughs> maximum a posteriori, posterior or map um, is what it's called, map. Uh, so map is similar except the, the differences that it can take into account um, prior information. So we'll get more into that in the Bayes theorem, but essentially they are different but they both use likelihood functions. But again, the goal of this is to optimize, it's an optimized way to fit the distribution of the data. So um, again, Emily is using it, used to identify what the most likely distribution is. So, and just for a quick note, Emily was applied in hydrologic hazards in Stedman and Cohen's paper of 86. 
um, as a way to include censored historic and paleo flood data in the, for flood frequency analysis. And in their paper, they even noted like MLE routines are shown to be substantially better than the adjusted moments estimator similar to the ones in 17C. So again, just to know, like it, it's been around, it's been, the value has been seen. It just took a little while to be able to get up to the ability to actually have the computer capacity to use it. So it is a, takes a bigger engine to run it. So MLE again is something, it, I don't know if it sounds hard to understand it visually and the way you think about it is pretty straightforward. So here, like for this one, we've got an example of some, some dots along a line. Um, and basically MLE can be used to locate the most likely location given a normal distribution. So, you know, given this data and that normal, you know, the data given that normal distribution. So it basically, I mean, I can give you the question. So which one is fits, which one is the, the data fit the, the distribution more, right? Like it should be pretty evident. Yeah, like C. Oh, it's, the idea is like what most likely value is should fit what you visually think, the way you actually think. It's just some, just some, al it's just some algorithms that's doing the job for you, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. So let's go through a, a quick example of just kind of conceptually what's happening. This is the data for example dam. It's our data that we're using in our workshops. Um, we're just going to use MLE here to kind of sort through and find and just see how it's kind of functioning. So remember, uh, we'll get more into this later on, but we're sampling distribute. We're sampling those LP3 parameters. We're getting new parameter sets as the algorithm goes along. And so it's finding a target space that is trying to, that maximizes its, its target space to find the most likely. So it's got to work its way there. And once it's there, then it's solving a bunch of different times to try to find what's the most likely. So as it steps through, you're going to see better and better results. So we'll talk about that. So say like, uh, and just for note, like it's called evolutions on here. So in best fit, each selection, each sample of LP3 parameter that you might see, um, it's just called evolutions in best fit. So, so maybe that's like, this one is like a, I think it level, it's level evolution 10. Um, and just know that there's, that should be negative 0.4. As you can tell, like from like Derek's curve, this very unhappy face is not a skew of zero. That's just a little typo right there. I get it fixed, but that's a negative 0.4 skew. So anyway, the point is, <laughs> just make sure that's clear. Uh, early on in the evolution, you get a LP3 sample that the data could have come from this parameter, but it's probably not the best likelihood. And it's not likely, right? So we'll go a little further around 2,500. You start to get uh, a little bit closer to zero skew, a little bit straighter line. The data could have come from this distribution, but just likely there's a more, I guess it's more likely there's another LP3 that fits it better, right? Um, sampling now up here around 7,100. Again, oh, we bounced to a, a positive skew at this point. So now I get more of a happy face. Uh, again, it looks like it's fitting the data better somewhat. Still not great. Go one more. Close to 10,000 now at this point. You're getting a, a, around a zero skew. It's fitting the data. So anyway, the point is like, the idea is I be thinking like when we're, when best fit sampling along, it's moving itself closer and closer to the target. And towards the end, it's just really searching around that target space. And it's getting a lot of examples that are probably really close to the same likelihood, but one is going to come out slightly better. So just, this is the same thing. The difference here is they're just showing like, log likelihood and values as they move uh, slightly more towards zero. Just the concept of just thinking like when you're looking at the results, when you're looking at the numbers, the log likelihoods, the better it fits the data, the more the data is more likely that the data came from this curve, the closer to zero that'll be. So, All right, kind of sum up this likelihood. So likelihood is looking at how likely the data is given the, the model, given theta or LP3 distribution. Um, you can say that the probability that the data came from the model, right? So data that's exact. So we have data that's like exact data that's systematic. We have our 
interval data that's like historical intervals or PSIs, and then we have our perception thresholds, our left sensor data, our NABs as well. So we have this makes up our likelihood equation. So in most cases for flow frequency analysis, you know, of course, we know we're using LP3. So remember that we convert likelihood function uh, to log space because of two reasons. One, the underflow, the multiplication of small numbers gets really small, and the other is just by converting to the log space, we, it makes this math easier. Just We're just adding the likelihoods instead of multiplying them. Um, so the likelihood function can also be a part of um, maximum, it could be part of MLE, maximum likelihood estimator, or part of Bayes' theorem. They are slightly different. Again, MAP uses posterior data information. And just remember, if, if you ever wondered, just the distribution fitting in BESA is using MLE. In Bayesian analysis, if you're only doing um, analysis on the input data that includes systematic historical and perception thresholds, the, the answer you'll get there will be the same as what you get in, in the distribution fitting. But if you add prior information like regional skews or some quantifiers, you'll end up getting a slightly different answer because there are two different types of likelihoods. So, <clears throat> so again, um, for our objectives of this one, hopefully you can ask questions. Um, we've kind of tried to define what likelihood function is, looked at some of the basic probabilities that kind of went into the, the derivative, like how we got, to, how we get to the final likelihood equation, and looked at how that equation changes per data source, which it does change a little bit. Um, and then again, just sampled through a couple of examples. Um, and so that's likelihood. One piece of the three pieces of the Bayesian, uh, the Bayes theorem.